Hey guys, hello, good evening, welcome to another episode of Sunday Night Live. It's uh, the middle of May already, can you believe it? It's crazy. <clears throat> so, anyway, here we are. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me and see me okay, actually, because I've uh, made some changes to some of my settings, so I'm hoping that you guys can actually hear me and see me okay. So, uh, I'm looking over at OBS, and everything looks good, so you should be able to hear me just fine, hopefully. Uh, so let's see, who do we have here already? We've got, um, oh, we've only got three people. <laughs> Normally I have way more than that, but hopefully I'm sh it'll pick up as, as the evening goes on, hopefully. Um, uh, last week... We were a little low on numbers, which is a bit of a shame, so it'd be nice if we could get back up to kind of more of the 24, 25 people that we tend to get. That would be good. Otherwise, I'm going to have to, you know, if we're starting to see lower and lower turnout, then I'm going to have to start thinking about how often I do this show and if it's kind of actually worth doing if I'm actually drawing enough of a crowd. So uh, I have to think about that. So maybe you guys that are my regulars... <clears throat> Uh, maybe you guys can actually help me uh, get the word out there to people that you know that are not here on a Sunday and don't really know anything about this show. Uh, if you think that what we do here would be great for them, then please do tell them about it and give them the link and everything. Because um, it would be great if we could get a bigger audience for this than, than we get. Um, you know, if I could get 50 to a show regularly that would be awesome that would be fantastic uh so who do we have we got uh tony um was the first one in the door and he he says sorry but i have to sleep almost over 30 degrees centigrade now well that is yeah that's fair enough that's pretty hot um so yeah absolutely go do that and maybe if if you want to uh catch the replay uh ken second in the door uh, oh, it looks like notifications have gone out late, so that might have something to do with it. That's not my fault. That will be the fault of YouTube. Because I actually set this up two hours ago. I scheduled it two hours ago. So, um, notifications should go out well ahead of time that um, there's a show scheduled. And I certainly put up adverts all over Facebook in all the usual places. Um, the one thing that isn't going out at the moment is the email. So that might not be helping. Uh, because I have an issue with, with uh, scheduling the emails at the moment. I have to do them manually. And I can't always do them manually at the moment. So uh, Ken was second in the door. Kyle is here. He says, hello. Watching a friend's live stream. We'll be here shortly. Okay, cool. Uh, and Ken was debating whether I was going to start late. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sound is good, excellent audio and video, good. Perfect. Yes, I've been um, just having a bit of a, a tinkering day today with a few things. I've been testing some new things that I can't really talk about, um, but I've also been checking out, um, just trying to find a better way to get a higher quality video and audio for the show. So I've been playing about with uh, my settings in OBS. Um, to see if I can improve the quality. So, yeah, that's my plan, anyway. And so, um, yeah, that's what I've been doing. And um, I had to, after I, I played about, I thought, you know what, I think I'll, I'll just set everything back as normal. <laughs> just for today's show, and then I'm going to do some test recordings through the course of the week. Uh, Duane552 is here, and Bobby Booth, of course, we cannot do a show without Bobby. So if Bobby stops coming to my show, that is it. We don't do the show anymore, <laughs> pretty much. No, I'm only kidding. I don't want to put that kind of pressure on Bobby. <laughs> he says he never got a notification. Um, he just knows. Yeah. Hopefully, my regular folks, you just, you just know that it's 6 p.m. Sunday, and that's, you know, that's kind of when this show happens. Um, but not everybody is gonna gonna have that. Uh, Bill Shep is here. Says just got in. I was editing vocals and lost track of time. Yeah. Well, you know what? <clears throat> I need lost track of time as well. 
so I actually hit the start stream button about two minutes past six, so sorry about that. Anyway, uh, I have been experimenting musically with just doing some different things and uh, trying a different method of uh, composing music. And this method involves a little bit more kind of random elements into the music, or at least allowing something random to be the stimulus for the piece. And I did this very recently, actually, uh, at work. It, this the whole thing kind of started with uh, something that was going that that was going on at work. Um, we have various uh, Skype chat groups for different departments at Personas, and uh, I was involved in one of the chats. And uh, I was using the audio feed from Skype, bringing that into Studio One whilst we were just generally chatting because I needed to test something and uh, I, I just thought, hey, I just need some audio. So I just ran Skype straight into Studio One and captured their audio. And somebody just happened to say something that I thought, you know what, That's if I took that little phrase completely out of context, it would be hilarious and it, it would be fantastic to do it for a piece of music. Um, so I thought, yeah, I, I, will, I will do that. And then I... Um, and I used that as the stimulus for this piece. And then I thought, okay, I'm going to do something else completely random. And I'm going to just open up my tie. I'm going to select a random preset. And then I'm going to open up the, I'm going to double click. So it creates um, a MIDI event. And then I'm just going to use the pencil tool. And I'm just going to randomly click some notes. And see what happens. See what comes up. So I did that. I'm not going to I'm going to play the resulting piece of music in just a minute, but I'm not going to play the vocal track because um uh I've not actually asked the guy who was speaking at that time if I can do that. Uh so I'd have to ask him and, and make sure that that's okay. He has a copy of of this with the vocal track. So uh he knows what it sounds like and um but yeah, I've not actually asked him his permission if I can actually play this on my show or not. So, uh, so yeah, so I'll play the resulting piece of music in just a minute, uh, and I'll take it apart a little bit, and hopefully it will provide you guys with some ideas for music making where you are you make use of random elements, and there there is actually a compositional technique and a compositional style within the Western classical music world called aleatorial music, which basically means music by chance. And uh, this is essentially what I did. I applied this, te this compositional technique, um, but I gave it a bit of a, modern, a more kind of modern twist. Uh, and I'll as, as I play the music, I'll unpack it a little bit, and I'll explain some of the challenges that went into creating something that has lots of chance elements in it. Now, when I say chance elements, I don't just mean I'm just improvising something. Improvisation is, it is kind of, to a degree, it's chance. In that uh, the melody line that I create improvisationally is, um, is unplanned, it's unrehearsed. What comes out of my fingers comes out of my fingers uh, at the piano or on the bass or if I'm singing or if I'm playing saxophone. You know, what comes out is to a degree chance. But there's also some elements of, you know, kind of thought as you improvise because you're thinking about chord tones, you're thinking about um, phrases and licks and you're thinking about a vocabulary, you're thinking about telling a story. And you're thinking about, um, you know, creating something that makes sense. You know, as I'm talking to you now into the camera, I'm improvising a monologue. I am using words that everybody that everybody knows, and I'm creating sentences and that kind of thing. So there is that kind of improvisational element to what this music is that I'm going to play for you, but it's much more chance than that because at the moment. As I'm talking to you, I'm using words and sentences to explain something that will become clear over time. And that's kind of what you do when you're improvising over a set of chord changes. You have a given subject matter, which is the chord changes, and then you create sentences 
and musical uh, ideas that are related into that context and they make sense within that context. All of that is a roundabout way to say that aleatorial music is different from improvisation, although it shares some common concepts and some common traits. It is a little bit different because aleatorial music is basically taking random events and making music out of them. John Cage was a was an early proponent of this kind of style of music. Um, but there have been other composers, and there is one really cool story of a guy who, uh, he got a whole bunch of hamsters. In fact, he got 12 hamsters. And he wrote a number on the back of each hamster. Hey, Tim Talks Audio in the house. Good to see you, Tim. Remember your chord, mate. There you go. You're in the house. That's cool, man. I'm glad you're here. <clears throat> We're kind of talking chance music and that kind of thing. So this guy, he had 12 hamsters, and he wrote a number onto the back of each one of these 12 hamsters. 12, because there are 12 semitones in an octave. And he set them all up in a line, and he had a predetermined end point, and he set them off. And he watched these... Uh, hamsters have this kind of race, I guess, although none of them was aware that it was a race. And so off they went, and he marked off the number of each hamster that came in over the finish line in, in the order that they came in over the finish line. And so that determined what his melody was going to be, or what his tone row was going to be. And so, you know, whatever notes, whatever order it was that they came in, that was the, uh, the, uh, the theme or the melodic motif that he would then use to then go on and develop his composition. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, I'm sure there were points where, you know, this, this kind of thing happened. And it was a dead heat because they all arrived at the same time, in which case, very short composition. But, uh, so that was his method, or at least one method that he explored. Weird. I agree. Totally. Um, but this wasn't it. <laughs> For me, uh, I kind of did maybe a 21st century Studio One version of that, whereas I, I used the pencil tool, and I penciled in random notes, and I liked what came out. <laughs> and so the combination of the vocal track, which I'm not going to play, uh, and the totally chance random click of, of a mouse created a bass part because I had randomly chosen a bass sound. <laughs> and so it developed from there. So in just a minute, I am going to play what came out. It's, it's not entirely finished. It's kind of just kind of uh, held together very thinly. Um, but it's kind of, I added various elements as I went um, to this bass line to try and make things fit as best as possible and to come up with at least something melodic to sit on the top of it. It was a challenge because the bass line is, doesn't really follow any kind of chord changes that you and that most people will relate to because it was just random mouse clicks. So I had to make some chord changes fit this random set of bass notes. And of course, the rhythm of this bass part. Uh, I, dis I had a decision to make. Do I go with the completely random nature of the rhythm of this bass part and write something that sounds like it is in a weird time signature when really it's in 4-4? Could have done that. Could have gone down that route. I uh, decided not to do that. I decided to, to juxtapose. What do I mean by that? I, I mean to make the, the weird arrhythmic nature of the bass part uh, set against a very straight rhythm part. And so the two would never really kind of meet. And that actually became really quite cool, as you will find out. All right, so people started coming. We've got 19 people here now, which is, which is pretty good. That's kind of a little uh, in the low end of our average turnout, but uh, Tim Talks Audio is here for the first time, which is great. Welcome, Tim. I'm glad you're here. 
Uh, Ken says, when I was in college, our university would have these noon hour concerts. I saw John Cage show once. One piece, the sheet music was written out in a circle, start to finish, wherever you want. Yes, I've heard people do that. Um, Steve Reich, the um, American uh, minimalist composer, uh, once walked out with his, with his um, I think it was a 15 or 16 piece ensemble and had everybody set up. Um, but nobody knew what the music was going to be. And uh, he basically gave everybody a single piece of paper and on that piece of paper was one note. And no one else in the band knew what they were going to get. They did not know what note they were going to get. But they knew that they were going to get this one note. And there was one simple rule. When somebody plays their note, the person next to them must not play their note. And so it became an exercise in <clears throat> not only improvisation, because you only got one note to play, but it became an exercise in listening because you had to make sure that you played your note where nobody else was playing your note, was no, where, where nobody else was playing their note. So it was a case of avoiding somebody else. Uh, and it was fascinating watching this group of musicians just listening to each other and fitting in their one note uh, in, into space. Uh, and then, of course, you know, obviously, occasionally, a couple of notes would meet, and then you would get chance harmony which was amazing, just totally chance harmony. Some of it was discordant, some of it a bit more concordant. And it was great. Uh, and then, of course, the conductor or the, the band leader decided, hey, let's up the tempo, let's do this twice as fast. So they did the whole thing twice as fast. It was brilliant. I loved it. Uh, most of the audience were completely bewildered because they were waiting for the rock band that was coming on in the second act. But anyway, <laughs> there we go. Uh, let's see, Zappa as well. Yeah, Zappa was, was into kind of chance stuff as well. Uh, Bob Studio says, as kids, we had an old upright piano. We added thumbtacks to hammers and threw soda cans against the low strings on the bottom. Yeah, you can create all sorts of... Uh, there is actually a, a com another compositional style called uh, prepared piano. Uh, Chick Corea has uh, the, the, the great jazz piano player and composer uh has experimented with this uh he wrote a piece a while back maybe in the the 1990s called who's inside the piano which is entirely a prepared piano thing where he had all sorts of miscellaneous items which he either threw inside the piano or used to strike the strings inside the piano and he didn't know where you know he'd like bounce a golf ball against the the open lid of the piano and he didn't know where what strings the golf ball was going to bounce on and it just created this very cool interesting music so yes that's another way to create chance music uh so i will play for you in just a second my uh my piece of chance music and hopefully you guys are going to enjoy it uh it's kind of as i say it's kind of chance and then created elements based on kind of that chance to make things kind of fit together is what I ended up doing. So let's go over to Studio One. And you can see what I've got here. Uh, there are not a whole lot of tracks. As you can see, there's only like uh, um, 11 channels of audio on the mixer. And then we've got some reverb channels and we've got some parallel compression stuff going on there. And uh, I'm going to play this and then I'll unpack it a little bit. And you'll see kind of where I'll I'll take everything away and you'll see kind of where this starts. All right, here we go.
All right, so there you go. That's that's the piece of music. So <clears throat> it started off with chance elements that were then added to. So what are the chance elements? Well, the first thing I did was I did this part, which I shall play for you just now. This is a synth bass part. which then just gets repeated throughout the whole piece. So there's kind of uh, a sense where this is kind of minimalist as much as it is also chance as well, because I'm basically just using one phrase, which I'm then repeating. So here it is again. All right, but then I'm layering a fretless bass with that, which I actually played on my own, um, on my own fretless bass. Here's that with that. And then I transpose the, uh, the fretless bass part down an octave as well. So let's add that into it. All right, and to that, I added um, a drum leap, a really straight down to the middle of the road rock drum beat, um, which comes out of my Matt Chamberlain Loop Loft collection. So this is Matt Jam Chamberlain playing a, a really nice straight groove. <laughs> Right, so there you go. You've got the the drums. You've got some parallel compression on the bass and the drums as well there. Uh, so then the challenge was to find some chords that would fit this really random bass line, and that took me quite a while. <laughs> Being that I am the kind of person that likes to play with harmony, and uh, I have this ability to be able to harmonize any note. So any you know any time anybody gives me any note, I can harmonize it. Um, this was a challenge because the notes of the bass part are really quite random. So I had to listen to try and find relationships between the notes in this pretty random bass part. Um, and if I could find at least two notes that were that kind of had some relationship together in each of the phrases of this random bass part, then I could ha I could find a chord that would fit at least vaguely fit these um, uh, these two uh, these uh, bass parts. So if we listen to just the drums and the bass again, you can you can hear the different phrases that there are. So it's kind of like four kind of distinctly different little phrases there. Each one, the rhythm is the same. How that happened, I don't know, because that definitely wasn't by design. I did just literally go click, 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 click. What I hadn't realized was that I had actually kind of clicked in a kind of relatively uniform manner. Don't know how I did that. But anyway, I thought the rhythm was very cool. And then uh, I thought the, the, the melody of the bass was really quite cool as well. Uh, so then I, I tried to work something out on the Fender Rhodes, and this is what we came up with. And then I layered a pad on top of that. Bring in some percussion. All right, so the next challenge was to put a melody on top of this and have it make sense and have it actually be something that you could hum, you could sing. So let's bring in 
uh, everything. So let's take off the the global solo, it's just leaving the one track muted. And so we'll bring in the trumpet and the flute. <laughs> Uh, you might have noticed that there was um, a, a guitar part that I didn't mention uh, in this tune, which is basically just this. Uh, which again comes out of um, Loop Loft, and it was a case of I just had to try and it was basically. Um, this little vamp played just on the east on an E, uh, which I then shifted about to try and make fit what we had um, here harmonically. So it kind of fits, um, but there's a point at the end of uh, each 12 bar section where it doesn't quite fit. But more or less, that little guitar part fits. And really, to be honest, I kind of had it low in the mix, and the reason why it's so low in the mix is because I wanted it to be felt rather than heard. So you're not really hearing uh, the notes particularly, you're just hearing, uh, you're hearing it as kind of an extra percussive element, really. Um, so that was, that was essentially the idea, and it all came out of just some random clicking, because I was, I was testing an issue um, uh, that I couldn't actually, as it turns out, I couldn't reproduce. And uh, I quite like the sound of this little bass line that kind of appeared in the midst of all this testing. So uh, there you go. I hope you liked my uh, my little piece. The melody actually um, took a little bit more thought because I had to find notes that fit all those weird chords. Um, but then I didn't want the melody to be atonal, which it could have been. It could have ended up being completely atonal or non-tonal, not necessarily atonal, but certainly non-tonal, non-diatonic. Uh, but I wanted a melody that made sense that people could broadly relate to. All right, so there we go. I hope you guys like that. Uh, let's see what the chat is. Okay, not really anything added to the chat, but we lost a few people by uh, playing that piece of music, and that's that's okay. Not going to be everybody's kind of thing. Uh, Bob says, Miles. Yeah, there's a muted trumpet there, which is kind of a little bit Miles Davis-y, I suppose. Uh, Tim says, my daughter is dancing, so something must be right. Well, that's good to know. There you go. It works. <laughs> Success! <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, what is what was the point? What was the point I was trying to make out of this? The point I was trying to make out of this is... If you're kind of stuck for writing something, um, and I don't know if you're like me, but I like to schedule when I write my songs. So that means I have a set time in the week or a set time in the day where I sit and that is my writing time. And I expect to have something at the end of my writing time. And it may well be that I have a finished song by the end of that writing time. Um, but it also could well mean that what I have is just a baseline or a motif that could be developed. And it may or may not get developed the next day. I may come back to it the next time and just go, yeah, you know what, that's, that's, that stinks. I, I, yeah, yeah. no, and I'll, and I'll put it away because I like to recycle things because, you know, any motif that I write can be used, if not now, then certainly uh, in a future song. So that's always possible. Helps if I remember to turn my sound off on my phone. There we go. Uh, Mike Neighbors here. He says, hello all. Sorry I'm late. Spring cleaning today. It's not, it's not, is it springtime? I suppose it is springtime. So fair enough. You can do that. 
Uh, so what did I learn? Um, I learned that chance music is fun. That's what I learned. Because you can end up challenging yourself to make the chance elements that you started with make sense and bring context to, you know, okay, I have this completely random set of notes. How do I make these random set of notes make sense and become something that I can develop, something that I can play with, something that I can, you know, play backwards, something that I can turn upside down, something I can transpose, something I can move around, something I can retrograde, something I can invert. Uh, you know, all those uh, motivic development ideas and concepts. You know, if you have a short piece of melody, you don't then have to go, okay, that's that's my melody, that's my short little fragment. I have said that little fragment. I then have to start another fragment. Yeah, but that's not how we talk, is it? We don't talk that way. We we talk in a way that that has context, that has development, that makes sense. Like when you're telling a story, even if you're just making up the story as you go, you are taking your listener on a journey. And so even with chance elements, you still need to be able to take your listener on a journey through those chance elements. So those chance elements, they still have the magic of being chance things, but they make sense. And you're still able to take the listener on a journey. Now that may well be in the case of um, Steve Reich, where he gave one note to each of the members of his band. Um, and they had to play that one note in a space where nobody else is playing. And it could well be that the idea is that you use dynamics to create the contrast. So you make them play loud, or you make one half of your band play loud, the other half of the band play soft, or vice versa. Um, you know, so there are different things that you can do to develop the chance elements. And that's kind of what I learned was if I'm stuck for something, if I'm stuck for an idea, if I'm sitting here in, in my studio on my writing time going, I have no idea where to start. I can start with chance. I can start with random notes and go from there. And that there is legit, it's, that's legit. That is a totally legit way to make music. Uh, because you never know what happens. Now, what may come out may not be any good. <laughs> you may get to the end of your session and go, you know what, that chance stuff really just doesn't make any sense. But it's definitely something worth exploring and, and something that is worth trying out. Because, you know, if all the sensible, I'm not saying that therefore that chance music is not sensible, it is. But if every other compositional avenue has been explored, then, and nothing is working out for you, then this is definitely something for you guys to try out. Uh, now, you know, you can, there are lots of different ways in which you can create chance music. And it doesn't have to be that you just like, you know, I, I can't see what I'm doing because <laughs> I'm not looking. So you could do that. You could just set up Studio One to record and then deliberately pick notes out. I mean, not obviously that short because, uh, but certainly pick out notes. And the thing that I was doing there was I was trying to deliberately avoid any sense of relationship between those notes. So, I mean, that's where you, you get into atonality a little bit. So, give it a go. Give it a try. And see kind of what comes out. And you can do it with lyric writing as well. Let's say you've got a, um, a really great piece of melody and you've got everything else worked out. Uh, but you just want to put words to it. You can do the same thing. You can, you can go down the whole route of chance lyric writing. Um, you, you know that there are, there are 
uh, all sorts of fun games you can play, fun word games that you, that you can play, where you have, let's say you have you have a party and you've got like 12 or 15 people in your room. At the moment, obviously, that's not going to happen because we're all on lockdown. But <clears throat> let's, let's imagine that we're no longer in lockdown and we're all celebrating the fact that we're no longer un, in lockdown. And I invite all 15 of you that are here in the chat to my studio. And I and in the middle of the studio, I put a table, a piece of paper and a pen. And I ask you all to go out of the room and to come in one at a time, write a sentence. Doesn't have to be any any sentence. The first, maybe the first five words that come into your mind and then fold over. Uh, the line that you've just written so that nobody can see it and then you get the next person in and the same you have the same rule the first five words that come into your mind and after that after all 15 people have, have been in and they've written their five words then you've got lyrics to a song right there and you know you may find that there are there are some some chance things that have happened that give you some interesting relationships between these five these groups of five words and you may even find there is humor there um because something something somebody said in one line the next line just makes it really really funny uh and right there you have lyrics for a song and then you just need to set those words to the melody that you already have so you know if you're struggling with lyrics, that's one way to that's one way to do it. Chance lyric writing. If you're struggling with melody, chance melody. If you're struggling with harmony, you know, start with a bass line that is totally random and try and make some chords fit it. That's a little bit more testing uh, of your understanding of harmony and your ear. But <clears throat> if you allow your ear to govern what's what is right in the context of your music then it will be you know if you kind of chuck out the rules of music for just a minute and go okay so here's my bass line and this chord does it fit what does my ear tell me does my ear tell me it fits no then you find something else and you keep going until you find a chord that fits that particular bass part or that particular line and uh you know what ends up coming out is what to your ear sounds good and that's the important thing all right let's have your questions we have 20 minutes left of the show so let's get your questions uh so your questions can be on anything to do with music production composing arranging songwriting mixing mastering the works i'll take any of those questions uh, we peaked out at 20 and we've lost a whole bunch of people because <laughs> now we're down to about half that, which is a bit of a shame. Uh, so, yeah. Let's get your questions. And we'll spend the next 20 minutes just dealing with those. <clears throat> porcupine tree, I think, is a good example, at least in rhythm. Yeah, porcupine tree um, actually are really, really rhythmically very experimental uh, and at times can certainly be harmonically adventurous as well which is good <clears throat> Tim says what chord is my chord your chord is F major hang on yeah your chord is a kind of F major 7 6 9 kind of thing There's, there's the F, there's the major third, five, major seven, there's the nine, and there's the six. There you go. Nice happy chord for a nice happy person. <laughs> so Mike Neighbor's been having a bit of a clear out and has chucked away a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, I remember doing that when we moved house, actually, when we moved from where we used to be before in my tiny little box studio. <clears throat> Sorry, I need to clear my throat. Um, 
we chucked so much stuff away. We actually filled two skips full of stuff. It was crazy. Didn't think that would happen. Uh, Tim says, what would you have done different for this song? What would I have done differently? Um, I think my choice of chords is a little weird. But there again, the, the bass line itself was a little bit weird. So um, I had to go down the non-diatonic route for chords because nothing diatonic would fit because the melody, the, the bass part was not diatonic. There were no, you know, there was, there was no kind of tonic dominant one, one, five relationship between any of the notes. <clears throat> you know, the, none of those notes in that tune. Uh, if we just quickly go back over there for a second. None of the notes in, in this little bass part here. Um, uh, they, they're not really related. Let's bring in the other basses. So there's nothing there that kind of has a kind of tonal relationship, you know, kind of like you would expect, you know, um, you know, in a, in a fairly standard rock song, you'd, you'd fairly, you know, you'd expect, you know, if you're kind of like into that, into early rock and roll. You know, that that's a very tonal little bass line. Because it spells out a C6 chord. You know, 1950s blues ballads would, would have been replete with this, you know. You know, kind of those kind of slow blues ballads of the 1950s. Everything was nice and diatonic. This bass part isn't like that. So I had to think outside of diatonic, normal diatonic harmony. So uh, what I came, kind of came up with was... Um, was kind of a uh, kind of a B kind of seven sharp eleven thing going to G uh, B flat six to A flat seven sharp eleven and then the second half of it repeats the two first chords to this kind of weird sounding chord which is kind of a uh, what would this be kind of a, 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 a D7, a D7 flat 5, yeah, D13 flat 5, because there's a 13, so, uh, so yeah, so that was kind of the, the chords that I came up with based out of this bass line because it was non-diatonic. So those chords don't really progress in an, in a, in a natural way. Kind of what holds them together, I think is this, uh, this kind of sense of, and you got a little kind of inverted pedal point at the top. So you got this kind of, this kind of melody being spelled out by the, the, the top voice of the chords. then so basically it's just kind of like this da, 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 which is I suppose a little bit like a police car or an ambulance or uh, so yeah I suppose I could have done that for the melody couldn't I but I didn't <laughs>
So yeah, so I, I kind of hope that that kind of answers that question. Uh, what would I have done differently? Uh, what would I have done differently? Maybe tried to fit diatonic chords over that kind of a bass line? <laughs> I don't know. Bob Studio says, I'm running Fader Port 16 in Studio One 4.1 on Windows 7. Uh, I have version 4.5, however 4.1 runs smoother in Windows 7. I ran Windows, uh, I ran Windows 7 for a long time. And I ran Studio One 4.5 and 4.6 on Windows 7 as well. Uh, they should run pretty well on, on both. Um, there could be another issue going on. There could be, uh, what does he say here? However, fader port sometimes freezes in full one. So should I go back to previous fader port release or universal control? Uh, if you're on the latest universal control, and if you are on the latest release for the fader port firmware and you're on windows seven, um, yeah, the, I think possibly the issue for you is maybe Windows 7. Um, because Windows 7 is no longer supported by Microsoft as of January. Uh, and from a Persona's point of view, Studio One 4.6 is the last version of Studio One that will support Windows 7 and Windows 8, in actual fact. Sorry, it's straightening my chair. So if you're on Windows 7 or Windows 8, uh, you can, you, you're going to kind of be stuck going forward. If that's, if that's okay for you, if you don't mind being stuck on Windows, uh, on, uh, um, Studio One 4.6 going forward, then that's fine. If you have found your niche and you are happy with it, then stay with it. But if you're going to stay with Windows 7, my recommendation would be that you get your computer offline now that you don't delay, you get that computer offline and you keep it offline. Because as of now, Windows 7 is a massive security th uh, risk to any user. So I would suggest that you definitely get your computer offline if you are on Windows 7. Uh, I ended up just buying a whole new computer. Now I'm aware that not everybody can do that, my situation was a little bit unique because my Windows 7 computer is old and um, I was starting to have problems with uh, the hardware inside the computer. Uh, so, you know, if you've got that kind of a problem, if your computer is randomly shutting itself down, then it's likely that you maybe have an issue with your motherboard or anything like that. And if you've got something like that, either replace the, the motherboard and start again and keep the machine, but you know, just upgrade it to Windows 10 and start with a new motherboard. That could be a whole option for you right there. And that means that going forward, you'll be able to um, support, you know, other builds of Studio One as and when they come out. Uh, Frank asks a question which I uh, cannot answer. <laughs> Uh, and Mike neighbor points that out very succinctly. Yes, I cannot answer that question because I'm not authorized to speak on uh, any future builds of Studio One. Uh, so there, that's the end of that question, really. Uh, Bob Studio says, always offline. Good. Okay. Yeah, definitely keep it offline. Um, but you will find that if you're going to stay on Windows 7, that you won't be able to progress with Studio One any further than where you are now. Uh, thinking of Mac. Okay, yeah, Mac is an expensive way to go, but it can be a good way to go. Um, I have a Mac just sat over there. I never thought I'd ever see the day that I'd go Mac, to be honest. No, I'm not going Mac. I, <laughs> I have added Mac to my arsenal. That's the way I see it. Uh, I will primarily always be a Windows person. Uh, but yeah, I'm adding a Mac to my arsenal because, you know, a lot of you guys use Macs and an awful lot of Persona's customers use Macs. And, you know, when 
customers have an issue, I need to be able to look at their system. And the only way I can look at a Mac system is on a Mac. So that's why I have it. <laughs> um, it's not like the most heavily spec Mac in the world, but it, it, it does exactly what I need it, which is I'm able to test things. I'm able to look at system info uh, for customers to have issues. I can do that on a Mac. Uh, can't look at a Mac system issue on on uh, Windows, obviously, and vice versa, because you just can't. Uh, but yeah, Mac is definitely a good option. I am, you know, I'm not going to get in into the whole Mac versus PC debate because, as far as I'm concerned, there isn't one. Use whatever tool works for you. That's my view. Whatever tool works for you, use it. If that means you are super comfortable on a Mac, go for it. If you're super comfortable on a PC, go for it. Just bear in mind that there are strengths and weaknesses of both platforms. You know, the real strength of the Mac is that everything is completely integrated and everything is built in-house, which means all the hardware, everything is built in-house by Apple. So that is a strength for Mac, which conversely is a weakness for PC because PC have parts by made by all sorts of third party vendors. So finding the right set of components for a PC that are going to integrate well together and work well together is a lot trickier. Whereas on a Mac, you just buy the Mac and you know that everything in that Mac is going to work together nicely. It's just the way it is. That's the strength of the Mac versus the weakness of the PC. The strength of the PC is that because all those parts are third party, it is much more customizable. It is much easier to upgrade parts on a PC than it is on a Mac. <laughs> so kind of it's interesting how the Mac's strength is the PC's weakness. The PC's strength is the Mac's weakness. So in that sense, there is a very level playing field between the two platforms, in my opinion, which is why I basically say, hey, you know, whatever works best for you, go for it. Uh, Tim says, I'm going the other way. I've been Mac for a while now, but I'm interpreting more PCs in my silly workflows. <laughs> and well, it's, it's really interesting. Actually, you're, you're re one of the things you are very good at, Tim, is, you know, when you're talking about uh, key commands on Mac, you are very quick to straight away um, interpret it for Windows users. You know, you you know when you're using command, that's control, and when you're using option, that's alt, and all of that, which is great because um, you know there are an awful lot of tutorial creators out there that are Mac users, and they create their tutorials on a Mac operating system. And so the way they speak is the Mac language. So to PC guys, not always that useful. So being able to know the difference between the menu system in, in Studio One on a Mac and the menu system uh, in Studio One on Windows is really, really useful because they are different. I know it's kind of weird that they're different, but they are. And there, I think the reason why is because the platforms are different and the, the, the way the operating systems are built is different. Um, because uh, my understanding is that Mac is based on a Unix code base and uh, Windows is not. <laughs> That's my understanding. And so the, the way they run is very different. So there you go. Uh, Tim is wanting to integrate a PC more into his workflow. Well, that's very cool. I like that. Uh, Mike Neighbor says, I just bought a brand new computer. I seriously considered Mac, but went PC because it's what I know. Yeah, and there's a lot of validity to that. You know, kind of go with what you know. Uh, Graham Cochran talks a lot about that. You know, in, and he actually uses it as an, as an argument why you shouldn't switch from one door to another. Uh, I can't really support that argument myself personally because I have switched 
I used Cubase for nearly 30 years. And uh, n now I've been using Studio One for six years. Am I going to switch to another DAW? I would say not. <laughs> I would say I'm home now. I have found the, DA the DAW that I've been wanting for, th you know, the best part of 35 years. Um, so, yeah, I'm unlikely to switch ever again. Um, but Graham's argument is find a door, stick to that door, know that door inside and out, and then stick to it. And, you know, don't move away from it. Because what's the point is his argument. Because, you know, he, he would say, you know, if you start looking over the fence, you're going to start thinking that the grass is always greener on the other side. So if you're a Studio One guy and you're looking over the hedgerow and you're looking at Reaper and you go, wow, Reaper does all of that for 60 bucks? <gasps> That's mental. I've got to go and jump over to Reaper. Which is fine. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to argue too terribly much with that in principle. Except to say that now means you have to go and learn a whole new uh, a whole new DAW, uh, and then once you've learned that DAW, you're going to start looking at logic, and you're going to start going, "Oh, logic does all has all of these marvelous virtual instruments, and has MIDI editing that is incredible." And so it goes on, and there are people that do that. They are door hoppers. They go from one door to another, to another, to another, and they learn that DAW but they don't make any music. <laughs> so I, I see his argument. I see his point. Uh, Tim says, that's huge for PCs, being able to change parts quickly and easily. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's one of the real big strengths um, that, you know, I have 16 gigs of RAM in this system right now, but I know I have slots that will take me up to 128 gigs of RAM if I really, really want it. And my operating system will take me up to 128 gigs of RAM if I really, really want it. And I've got plenty of space for another six hard drives, if I really, really want it. Uh, and I'm talking SSDs. There are slots for several more SSDs. I've got two in there just now, uh, and there's space for another five. So I could have, I don't know, I could, I, if I had the money, I could go and get like 10 terabytes of SSD storage if I really wanted to. <laughs> so, but yeah, and you can't really do that in a Mac you know, it's quite hard, especially the iMacs. The iMacs are really, really hard to upgrade because you have to take the screen out and then it can be an issue trying to get it back in and then trying to get it to stay in. Oh, out. Just punched myself in the ear. I run big box desktop so I can get into the parts. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, PCs are really good for being able to just open up and take out RAM and put new RAM in. You know, not so easy on a Mac. Bob Studio says, I was a Cakewalk Sona guy for 20 years. Yeah, I, you know, I know a number of folks that have come over from um, Sonar to Studio One. My neighbor says, that's how I was with Mac slash PC. I thought the grass would be greener with Mac. Then I discovered all the Mac shortcomings with audio. Don't want to learn a new set of issues, so I stayed PC. Yeah, Mac is definitely a bit of a learning curve. How it handles audio is a little bit different to how, how PCs do it. Uh, and that's, you know, that's the issue for me. I'm having to learn Mac uh, in a lot more detail than I ever thought I would ever need to. Uh, so I'm spending a lot of time kind of translating what I do on a PC over to a Mac so that when I have Mac customers that, that need support, and they've got a question or they've got an issue that they're facing, I can dive in deep into a Mac and I can figure out what needs to be, uh, what needs to be addressed. Uh, let's see. Bopsu says, we're just getting used to how to do things differently now. Cool. Uh, Bill says, I have 32 gigs of RAM and four hard drives in an i7 Windows 10 PC from 2014. Well, my, my old computer was a 2014 i5 with 8 gigs of RAM because at that time that was all I could afford. I couldn't have afforded really to go very, very, very much higher. So, um, but that said, you know, uh, my business is doing well. I 
I'm running that full time and I am working for Prusonus full time. So the combination of the two has meant I'm able to buy more gear and I'm able to up my RAM if I want to uh, and do things I couldn't consider doing a while back. Um, uh, okay, let's see. Bill says, my computer had 16 gigs when I got it. After four years, one of the sticks of RAM went bad, so I upgraded my RAM at that time. I, and that's, again, it's just so easy that you can just, you know, just pull it out, put a new one in, job done. The only thing you have to be aware of with RAM is making sure that the RAM sticks are compatible. You know, that can be a little bit tricky if you don't really know what you're doing. That can be tricky. Uh, let's see, any more songwriting kind of questions? We are actually over time now, but I'm keen to get some more songwriting slash uh, mixing kind of questions as well, if there are any. If there aren't, then we'll just end the show right here. But otherwise, Donny Hill's here. Hey, Donny, good to see you, buddy. Welcome. Hope you've uh, found this show useful and helpful. So we are dwindling away. We're about 12 people in the room now. And we peaked, I think, uh, 20? Yeah, we peaked at 20. So I guess at this point, unless anybody is furiously typing a question, uh, we will end the show here. Uh, I'll play this tune one more time before uh, we close out. Uh, and I'll I'll um, check questions at that point as well. So let's play this again. All right, let's uh, turn off solo. There we go, folks. Uh, that was the tune. Hope you liked it. As I say, it all kind of started with uh, a random bass line and kind of went from there. So I think we're all done for the night, I think. I don't see any further questions. And we're dropping down to single figures now. So I'm going to wrap the show there. Thanks ever so much, everybody, for coming. And... Thank you very much, Tim, for uh, coming for the first time. That is very, very cool of you. I hope you are going to be able to make it a little bit more regularly. That would be great if you can. Um, it would be great to have your input into the show as, as much as uh, anything else. Uh, Bob Studio says, I wouldn't mind running a real kit on this. Well, that is actually a real drum set that's on this tune. Um, as I say, it's... it's uh, it's just a a, um, a drum loop from Loop Loft. It's Matt Chamberlain playing his... Um, what's he playing on this one? I think it's his Gretsch drum set. Certainly sounds like a Gretsch. Hang on, let's, let's play it. So there. So there you see, it is it is actually a real drum set. Um, but it's just a loop. So there you go. Uh, I hope you found this useful and helpful. And I will see you, I guess, on uh, Wednesday over at Johnny Guy's channel for another episode of Songwriting Simplified. Uh, and until then, folks, good night. <laughs>
Good night, everybody.